So we're delighted to have with us today, uh, this afternoon, Alicia Nagel. And Alicia is the owner of Alicia Nagel Creative. And she's provided branding, marketing, and design services since 2008 to over 100 brands. Uh, that's amazing. And in addition to running that business, she's also been marketing director for the state's largest locally owned helicopter company, Paradise Helicopters, and worked as strategic marketing manager for a tech firm in Portland called Graybox. Prior to that, she was a brand storyteller for a multidisciplinary design firm in LA and started her career working as a studio artist at various advertising agencies in LA and San Francisco. And she holds a mass communications degree from Boston University. Um, she also has a side project. It's called www.hustlewithaloha.com. And feel free to click on that. And she's working on a do-yourself branding course for entrepreneurs. So we're, we're just thrilled that she's uh, generously shared her time and her expertise with us this afternoon. And so with that, I'm going to sell, send it over to Alicia. Take it away. Thank you so much, Dennis. I'm so excited to be here. Aloha, everybody. Today, we're going to talk about who gives a brand? What's branding and what can it do for your business? My goal today is to shed light on this and also give you a bunch of tools that you can take away from this workshop and kickstart the process on your own. So I don't think I need to reintroduce myself. Dennis did a great job. Thank you so much. Um, and first things first, I roll, why should we give a hoot about branding? And it's not just me that is excited about it. There are plenty others. For example, Forbes magazine uh, says the right brand strategy, powerful, consistent depictions of your brand via marketing are actually more critical than a company's success to, to a company's success than product design and quality. Wow, that's concerning, right? Who else? Well, um, the guy who started Forbes magazine says that your brand is the single most important investment you can make in your business. And we have celebrities like um, Serena Williams saying things like, I want to be the brand instead of being the face. So these are not just experts saying this. Branding in a very tangible way also makes you more efficient and effective. And I'm here to show you a little bit about how that is. Ultimately, branding helps you say the right thing in the right way to the right person at the right time. And why does this matter so much? Well, studies show that 80% of consumers are more likely to do business with a company that offers personalized experiences. But most of us here are small businesses. How in the name of all that is holy are we supposed to connect with all of these people out there? Well, one of the things that branding does for you is it helps you identify the people who are more likely to be receptive to your message. When you look at the classic sales funnel, typically we start from the top and the idea is you fill all these people in from the top, send your marketing campaign to everybody and then some of them will stick. We'll get a few leads and amongst the leads, you'll get a few opportunities and amongst the opportunities, some of them will turn into sales. Some of them will become long-term clients. Hopefully you'll retain them. And then the ultimate goal is to have a brand super fan who tells everybody about your business, right? Well, I like to say branding is this great pair of scissors that comes in and just cuts off the wings. So if we end up going after just the people who are more likely to be interested in what we have to say, it becomes more of a tube and less of a funnel. And as small businesses and entrepreneurs, we become more efficient and effective from the beginning instead of just blasting our message out to everybody. So what does branding look like in practice? Well, it tells a story, not just any story, it tells your story as a business. And it tells your unique story, the one that your customers care about. So if we were to see some examples of this, what might that look like? Um, I pulled some old examples of advertising. So here's a beautiful ad for the, the Hilton. This is a long time ago. We have some outdated advertising and concepts here. And then today, if we were to apply the concept of brand strategy to this, it might look something like this ad for the Alani. Branding helps you capture a special moment. It's that exhilarating vacation has started feeling. Whereas you see how the one on the left is, there's nothing really emotional about it. There's a bunch of buildings and, and skyscrapers and stuff. And that's the old model, right? If we were to look at a more recent example of this, um, we might see this real estate ad. There's nothing wrong with it. 
People like to see faces. They want to know who they're working with. However, if we were to use brand strategy to get inside the heart and the mind of the customer, we might have something like this. Branding helps customers connect with the feeling. People who move to the islands, they do it because they fall in love with the lifestyle a lot of times. And the ad on the right shows that this real estate agent gets her clientele. So these are some examples of what branding looks like in practice. But branding is a squishy term, and I'd love to dispel some branding myths as we go along. First of all, branding is not just for big corporations. In fact, people choose to do business with brands that they can connect with. And small businesses who tell their brand story are going to resonate with customers. Not just me that is saying this. We have Sig Zane. He is the locally famous fashion designer based in Hilo on the Big Island, known for weaving Hawaii's roots back into the Aloha shirt. Um, this is his his son. Um, Ko, uh, excuse me, I can't see the slide. <laughs> Kuhao Zane, uh, Zane. and um, he's one of the first designers to incorporate native Hawaiian plant imagery into clothing designs. And Kuhao says that every time I listen to a story from a brand, each of these brands on our islands are delivering something of quality and they're so unique. Their storyline is catchy. And I would tell them, hey, you guys have a lot of gold already within yourselves. All you have to do is identify that and start to pull apart the different elements of your narrative. Another great example of this, um, this is an old client of mine, Tasty Kona is right on Ali'i Drive below Poncho and Lefties. And they specialize in carrying local brands. And I think that they do a wonderful job of highlighting each brand and picking ones with stories. Some other examples will come later in the presentation as well, but these are just a couple. Branding is also not a luxury. In fact, it can save you money. Even a little bit will have a huge impact. An um, example of this is some work I did for Kokolikalani Farms. They're a chocolate and coffee farm in Kona. And this was their um, existing packaging uh, pretty simple, hold together uh, piece of cardboard with some labels. And um, I helped them redesign it. So it now has a sense of place. It feels luxurious. There's a riotous, nostalgic colors that are happening. Um, the inside highlights their bragging point. The dark and the milk chocolate look different. Um, and the client let me know that they saw an increase in chocolate bar sales after they put the redesigned products on the shelves. So investing in some branding and having it inspire your design can have an impact on your bottom line. What are some more branding myths? Well, I'd like to clear up that your brand is not necessarily your logo. Your logo is an expression of your brand. And I'm not the only one saying this. This is Seth Godin. He said this. He's Some people would say he's the, one of the forefathers of branding. Also, Harvard Business Review specifically had an article about how your brand is not your logo. I think maybe the only time your brand might be a logo, maybe if you're a cow and you got branded. Your brand is also not simply who you say you are. For example, um, if I say that I am the, the fastest runner in the world, and that's the brand I'm projecting, but others aren't perceiving me as the fastest runner in the world, guess what? Just because I say I'm that doesn't mean I am that. When you have a gap between these two things, it's called a brand gap. Um, for example, you could say your market in your marketing that your restaurant is the most romantic date spot in town. However, if your customers actually value you for your no-fuss, family-friendly, affordable meals, then if you're marketing yourself as a date spot, you're not going to hit the mark. There's a gap between who you are and what people are perceiving you to be. Managing people's expectations of your brand is key to building trust. Simply put, if you do what you say you're going to do and then you deliver on it, that builds trust. When your marketing authentically represents who you are, you're fulfilling a promise that your brand is making to your customers. And here we have a, a quote from Zig Ziglar just saying, if people like you, they will listen to you, but if they trust you, they'll do business with you. Brands also are not created. They are discovered. And we'll show you the process today to discover your own brand. It's also why most of my branding process, I call archaeology. This is the three-step three -step process that I, in a nutshell, take you through. Um, archaeology, because we're unearthing the elements that already exist about your brand, your audience, your competition, who you are as a, as a personality, as a business, and holding each of those, up, those items up into the light to examine it. What does it look like? How, how, how are we different from others? What matters to us? And then the next stage I call alchemy because we're taking these elements and we're putting them together with the goal 
of making brand gold? How can we distill and infuse and combine them into something, a story that's going to be captivating and resonate with your target audience? And then lastly, application. Application would be things like a logo, a tagline, a website, marketing messages, media mix, stuff like that. So without further ado, let's talk about discovering your brand. We talked about what branding is and a bunch of things that it's not in the hopes of clarifying what exactly we're talking about. So this is the overall process that I have for branding. It has five parts. The first one is, so we're starting with the basic stuff here. Basically, what's your company about? And then what's your competitive environment? And this is not just other companies that do exactly what you do, but anything that solves the same problem that you're solving in the customer's life. Next, we talk about the target audience. There are multiple. Next, we talk about personality. And this has to do with, um, you know, what's the vibe that you are comfortable communicating with? Do people think of you as like a friendly brand, as an authority brand? Um, maybe someone that they come to for solace and time of need. And then lastly comes that art, the alchemy part where we take all of these together and come up with a big idea. A detailed version of this diagram is available at this QR code if you want to download it. And um, this is way more detailed. It talks about what the different elements are within each of these. And the idea is to go through the process from left to right. And um, these things get put in the beaker to come up with the big idea. And then you yield things like unifying concepts that make sense for your brand, key messages, a value proposition, uh, the voice, look, and feel of your brand. And you can communicate these through many different deliverables. Um, a brand brief, uh, is, I'll go over these a little bit more in, in detail later, um, a target audience profile, a brand vocabulary map, or a detailed brand storybook. But first, I'd love to dive into each of these elements um, and clarify the things in them that might not be readily understandable just from the word. Some of the words are very obvious and they make sense on their own. So for the first one, we have your company profile. And this is, what do you do? What do you offer? But also your mission statement. Like, what are you seeking to add to the world? Benefits, your growth goals. It's important to know your goals because you might start, if your goals are to expand your business, then you, the language that you use and the target audiences that you go out after might be a little bit more aspirational. Your reason for starting the company is a great thing to include in this section. Your strengths. Um, as a business over other ones. And then opportunities for improvement. It's just good to be honest about those so that you're not making promises that you can't fulfill. And just like a broad overview of what you're currently doing to market yourself. I do want to touch a little bit on benefits. So there's an obvious benefit, like something is fast or it's affordable or it's, it's um, the best of its version, the quality is good. But there's also something that I like to call intangible benefits. And these are things that you can't really put your finger on, but can help somebody make the decision to buy. For example, no buyer's remorse. That's a powerful one. Maybe it's custom tailoring that helps people be confident in their own skin. Maybe it's high design that makes people feel cutting edge. Or maybe you're a local business and or you have ethical business practices. And so by purchasing from you, they get like a warm, fuzzy feeling. A luxury item could be something that allows someone to express self-love for themselves or have bragging rights over a friend. These are examples of things that are benefits that your customer gets from doing business with your business that are not necessarily inherently tangibly present in the, in the product or service. The next phase is looking at the competitive environment. And again, this is not just your competition, but the whole environment, right? Also, what advantages do you have over the competition? What external influences are present? Maybe it's the economy. Maybe it's the emergence of chat GPT. Perhaps it's the time of year or seasonal fluctuations. I'd also, also dig in a little deeper on market positioning in just a moment. And then it's important to be aware of industry trends and to identify them as things that you may want to adhere to so that you look like you belong or completely ignore and be different so that you can stand out. An example of this is to look at, um, this is from some work I did for Hawaii Island Adult Care in Hilo. I like to look at all of the competitors and look at do's and don'ts. So it's great to learn lessons from other brands who are doing things well and who are maybe doing things that we want to avoid. So even by just looking at your competition, you can start to develop a creative plan for your messaging. 
This is an example of market positioning. Typically, it's an XY axis. Usually, one of the axes is price, so lower price and higher price. And then some other trait that you want to differentiate on is on the other axis. In this case, we're looking at coffee um, and traditional ways of making coffee versus trendy ways of making coffee. And what this does is it helps you identify a segment of the market that you need to compete against. For example, if you're a coffee grower in Kona, you're not competing with Folgers, let's be honest, right? You're also not competing with someone who has um, a really expensive espresso machine, most likely because that's like a DIY. You're not, um, maybe you're making coffee and selling it and someone who's going to DIY is not going to uh, want to purchase your coffee because they want to make their own. And then on the extremely trendy lower price size, you have people who are growing their own coffee. You're not competing with them either. And so these price points at the middle, we have Starbucks and then Hualalai, Kona Coffee and Tea, et cetera. Um, for example, if you were Volcanico, which, oh my gosh, how much does it retail for? I wrote it down because I knew I wanted to have it. $170 for a bag of uh, Kona Peaberry Coffee by Volcanica. The people that you're competing with are very niche in the market. And so it can help you instead of spreading your message to everyone in the world that drinks coffee, you can just go after the people and the, the brands that are in your position of the market. Another thing is that's good to look at is um, industry trends. I designed a logo for a women's health brand. And if I hadn't have looked at all of these, I wouldn't have concluded that a lot of them are purple, a lot of them are swooshy, and a lot of them are women's bodies. And so right away, we knew that we didn't want to do any of those things. And so it helps you um, identify trends that you may want to, again, adhere to or to ignore. As Marty Neumeyer puts it, when everybody zigs, maybe you should zag. The next phase of the brand strategy process is to consider your target audience. And I like to, to um, split this up into primary audience and secondary audience. And a primary audience is, are the people who are going to be purchasing and using your product. A secondary audience might be someone who is buying it as a gift or they're a gatekeeper to reach the primary audience. Uh, if your primary audience is an executive, perhaps the secondary audience is their secretary or their personal assistant because the primary audience is so busy that they're not the one doing the initial research. And so you have to consider the secondary audience to even reach them. So when you look at the audience, you want to think of demographics. This is something that we're probably all familiar with. If you're not, it's like the basics of a, a group of people. It's their age, the socioeconomic status, uh, their region that they live in, their family structure. Are they like single or have a family or married or whatever. Um, and those are the basics and can be a foundational aspect of your different audiences. However, it's also great to think about their lifestyle. What matters to them? What sort of activities or purchases or things do they do that sort of define who they are? What are their motivations? Are they wanting to be a good parent? Are they wanting to be respected from their peers. And if it's a business, do they want to um, be healthy and feel good about their decisions as they use their product? Looking at their decision-making process can be absolutely massive to helping you come up with communications that are going to be effective. As we look for them, uh, as we start with the first problem that makes them need a product such as yours, then they become aware of your product and then they uh, consider the options, your product against other ones or your service or whatever it is. Um, and then there's often a tipping point, a point at which they ultimately make the decision to do business with you. And then they make the purchase. So at every one of these stages, it's important to think about how your brand is being represented. Are you consistent? Are you organized? Are you clear? Are you friendly? And then lastly, what um, are influencers for this target audience. And that's not just like social media influencers, which I think that word has become a thing these days, um, but also are they influenced by trends? Are they influenced by, um, you know, their peers, celebrities, um, what their neighbors are doing, stuff like that. So here's an example of uh, the difference between a primary audience and a secondary audience. If you are Molly Diver's jewelry, jewelers, uh, your primary audiences might be buyers, such as larger retailers, um, and also the, uh, and the person who's going to wear the item. A secondary audience might be 
a significant other or a fashion um, consultant who would make the recommendation or buy the item as a gift. So in your marketing, you want to make sure not to alienate um, significant others or like make jokes at the expense of the people who might be in a position of power to make it so that your customers may or may not end up purchasing your product. A really wonderful example of target audiences profiles was published in Vanity Fair a long time ago. It's a little old and moldy, but it is hilarious. I promise you, if you QR code um, this and download it, I promise you'll be really amused and it might give you some inspiration onto how you could paint a vivid picture of your target audience. When we look at the client's decision-making process, we want to anticipate the questions that pop into their head. For example, hmm, this is pretty interesting or cool. So they're becoming aware that they might want something like this. They are starting to consider it. They want to seek more information. They might look at the packaging or go to the website um, or interact with the item by touching it. Next, they are going to start justifying the purchase. Studies show that we make the decision to buy something with our emotions, and then we use our brain to seek facts to justify the purchase that we've already decided to make. And then there's some sort of deciding factor. They decide that ultimately this is worth it, uh, the value is good, or the time is now, or what have you. Um, and they decide that it's it's the right thing for them. And then ultimately they decide to buy. So if you take this five part process and anticipate the questions that are coming into your customers' heads as they're coming, it can help you do things like design a website that has high level information on the homepage and then slowly drives your customer into the purchasing process. If you'd like to dig deeper on this, I have a pretty lengthy blog article with questions to create a website content strategy. It helps you anticipate your customer's decision-making process to create a persuasive and intuitive website and you can access it at this QR code. All right, so next is personality. And this is not just your personality as a founder. If you are a small, quite a small business, then your personal personality is going to be infused into your business for sure but it's also your team and your larger brand. So what's the look and feel that feels uh, appropriate for your communications? What is your brand's relationship with the audience? Um, I think I touched on this a little bit earlier. Are you a rallying cry and encouraging coach that's gonna build them up and help them take action? Are you a brand that needs to soothe and calm and reassure and be a sanctuary and an oasis for your customers? Are you... Um, a brand that needs to be an authority figure, you need to have an answer for everything. Maybe you're a thought leader, a, a lawyer or a CPA or something like that. So understanding the relationship that you have with your audience is going to be key to deciding what sort of words and colors um, and messages are going to feel authentic and appropriate. It's important to understand your reputation, um, especially when we talked about that brand gap. So what are, what are the perceptions that are out there and how do they reflect or resonate with who you are? Your philosophy is a little bit of your personality. Um, for example, if you believe that, you know, no expense is barred, you want to have the, the most um, high quality ingredients and processes known to mankind, um, and you just like, if no, no expense is spared, then that's a really important philosophy for you to weave into your personality because the way that you communicate on behalf of your brand is going to be probably sophisticated and confident and um, maybe a little snooty and maybe that's okay. Any sort of heroes um, that are in your brand, your company are good to call out in this section. And this might be anyone or anyone from a chocolatier or perhaps um, in the Sig Zane example, some designers who are uh, really important to what you're putting out. And then lastly, especially if you are an entrepreneur or a solopreneur or like a thought leader type brand, your personal style. Are you bubbly? Are you loud? Do you talk a lot? Are you more reserved? Um, or maybe a little bit more conservative? This should also influence your communications on behalf of your brand, because if you are a reserved person, you probably don't want a rainbow logo that's really bright, right? The expression of the brand is going to reflect um, your personality as a brand and a person. So what are some examples of how this might look? Um, 
one example of uh, expression of a brand that maybe they don't have a, a really vibrant personality might be just a regular vodka bottle. I mean, and this just looks like it could be a water water bottle. I don't can't think of something that has less personality as opposed to ocean vodka. My goodness, so much personality. And um, on their website, they say journey back in time with Hawaiian demigods and venture to the depths of the sea to discover the secrets behind ocean organic vodka's international award-winning premium spirit. I mean, compared to the other one, that's super extra. And there's a lot of personality going on there. And their bottle even looks really creative as well. So this is an example of how a brand strategy could be used to um, express on behalf of products. A great way to get started on this is to sort of go shopping for personality traits. So I have um, a wide range of personality traits here, which you can download at this QR code if you wish. And the idea is to circle the ones that you feel resonate with what your business brand will be represented as. I know this is a lot and it does verge on the woo woo. And my clients have called me a brand therapist before. But I want to reassure you that there's a point to going to the heart of the matter, to the why. There's a great TED talk about this, in fact, uh, by Simon Sinek, where he talks about how if you want to inspire action, if you talk to the why, you will convince people and onboard them from the beginning. Not necessarily how you're going to do it, not even what you're doing, but why you're doing it. And this captures people's emotions, which I already touched on earlier, um, is at the root of why they make the decisions to purchase. So once you have all these elements, you've done this archaeology and you have all these things about your business and brand, the next thing to do is to hopefully come up with a big idea, some sort of unifying concept that encaptures what you're trying to do, uh, some key messages that raise people's eyebrows so that they want to know more, a value proposition. What is the brand promise that you're making to your customer? And also this extends into a voice, a look, and a feel. Now, a value proposition is something that you might put on a billboard. And the idea is to be concise. I say billboard because you can only put so many words up there. Saul Bass, who is one of the most famous logo designers out there from the 50s through the, uh, I think he ended his design career in 1995. He was known for making iconic logos uh, such as, you guys know this one? United Way. How about this one? Girl Scouts. <laughs> AT&T. Um, and so he encourages us to symbolize and summarize, which is, I think, just so key to this. A logo should not be complicated. It should have a concept in it, right? But um, you don't want it to be too much, right? Some examples of um, a big idea and how this might be uh, put into action is I had a client who, she gave me a pretty prescriptive, um, she's a doula which is a trained professional who provides expert guidance and support during childbirth, miscarriage and abortion. And she specifically was obsessed with Art Nouveau and she loved poppies. And she said, I want it to be, a, a, just give me a poppy logo that's red and, and green. Um, but I really wanted to dive deep and sort of tell a story about what she does. And so instead of just a poppy, it's a circle of life of a poppy showing the seed pod, the bloom that's in full bloom and the emerging bud. Um, and so by trying to infuse the big idea, you can tell a story in a very succinct way. Another example of this is um, a client of mine, they are market researchers. They're committed to delivering executive level reports. So a lot of times market research firms develop a massive amount of data and then they give it to the executive team of their client. And they're like, we don't have time for this. TLDR, too long, didn't read. Like, <laughs> Who has time for that? Um, and so this company really wanted to commit to being succinct. Um, and hey, they really like to drink whiskey. And so they named their firm uh, Distill Research because the idea was they were distilling all the information into something small. Um, and turns out in the whiskey making process, there is a glass beaker that is called, amusingly enough, the retort. Um, and it is shaped like these things on the left. Uh, and so I use that to inspire something that looks like it could also be an abstract D or a speech bubble. And on their website, the bottom right, um, there was some liquid that would bubble up and then it would drip down and fill up their logo. And so what started off as something that was simple can become a big idea 
and can reinforce their brand promise, which is that it's going to be succinct and just the information that you need. Another example of how to capture a brand strategy into a big idea might be a tagline and a concept. So this company, um, I did their tagline of own your horizon. They sell parcels of mostly undeveloped rural land um, that are all over uh, the nation and the states you can see below. And investing in undeveloped land is an investment that's like really emotional. It's kind of like the American dream, like pioneering and getting away from it all. And so they really wanted something that inspired people and made them think about capturing that feeling. So own your horizon is about, you don't have any neighbors, you're in the middle of nowhere. And that horizon, that's your property. A famous example of using a big, uh, big idea and in, in to express a brand is Nike. So we all know their tagline of just do it, right? If they had on Simon Sinek's model, if they had just talked about what they did, they would say, we're sports equipment for the gutsy athlete. I feel like a lot of times people feel the need to say what they do in their tagline. So aren't we glad that Nike didn't do that? <laughs> Instead, they said, just do it. They're jumping into the, the conversation in your head about like, oh, should I, should I push myself harder? Or should I go for a run today? Or should I, do I think I can make that slam dunk? Um, and it allows them as a concept to have these ads that are way more captivating. And this is one of my favorites. Yesterday, you said tomorrow. So if you're an athlete who's trying to get up the guts to do the thing, this is totally on brand for them. And it really just captures a moment in your head and gets you to think. So a lot of times people have a logo already or a brand um, that they don't feel is being expressed by their visual materials or their copywriting or whatever it is. Um, and in those instances, it's what's called a brand refresh because a brand already exists, right? And so the way it's being applied might just need a refreshing. I'd like to just dispel the myth that rebranding exists. It's, you can't really rebrand, your brand already exists. You need to keep the story, keep some of the visual elements, and then build on the brand equity that you've accrued over time. Some brands that did this correctly, um, that kept their story and their visual elements, might be John Deere. Holy moly, 1876, Deere was still jumping. How about Starbucks? Still feels the same. I feel like we've just slowly zoomed closer and closer to her. Maybe eventually it'll just be an eyeball. I don't know. Um, some examples of local brands that have I've done a brand refresh for were our Hawaii Island Adult Care. So we still have the Lehua Blossom, but it's more modern. Big Island Commercial Properties. We still have the horizon, but it's a little cooler. Ladies Art is in market. We still have the golden glam, but it's a little fresher. So once you have your brand defined through this process, how do you capture that and record it so that your company and team can use it? Well, we have different ways of doing this. There's something called a brand brief. It's basically a written summary of the main elements of your brand, the things that I just went through, company profile, competitive environment, target audience, brand personality, and ideas. You might have a color palette story that is told. You might have a brand vocabulary map where you have key concepts to your brand and then you have synonyms so that it helps you be using vocabulary that's relevant without saying the same thing over and over again. You might have a chat GPT query that you use to reliably generate social media uh, posts that are on brand for you. You might have your target audience profile. And I just wanted to, I, I did give you like um, an idea of this and I have a, a handout for you, but I just want to express that the point is to be able to imagine your target audience like in your head and have a conversation with them basically. And I'm a visual person. So I tend to like, want to do a collage or a cartoon um, but you could also do like a character description in a novel or if, if it's right for your brand maybe make your target audience a tinder profile another way of doing this is um to just fill out this worksheet that i've created uh, it goes through some of the main demographics in the beginning of it towards the top and then it gets a little bit more specific and digs it deeper into their motivations and stuff like that if you'd like to download it there's a qr code here and you can take that and put it to use right away 
Another uh, way you might express your brand strategy is through something called a brand storybook. Um, this is one that I made for Sashi uh, Sushi Restaurant in Los Angeles. And the purpose that this, this provided was to in, inform the design team in building out the restaurant, but it was also used at the beginning of their private placement memorandum, which is a fancy way of saying a document that tries to get people to invest in the restaurant. And restaurants are notoriously fickle and don't really have a great ROI. Uh, for investment. And so it's really important for them to sell a story and a vision, right? Because if you're going to invest in a restaurant, it's probably because you want to have cool nights there where you like bring your friends and you get to say, I invested in a restaurant. And if it doesn't exist yet, you better paint a pretty compelling brand picture beforehand. So once you have um, some of these documents, the good news is you suddenly have a brand manager on staff 24 seven, and you don't really have to pay for them. They're documents, right? So when you have a meeting or when you're considering creating some marketing materials, have your brand brief or your brand book sit at the table and bring your target audience profile too. If you have those and you consult them for every um, marketing decision moving forward, I guarantee you it'll be a strong foundation and things will be more relevant. You'll be able to be efficient and cut the wings off that marketing funnel. You'll be able to come up with social media posts that are relevant and interesting to your target audience. You'll be able to use your brand book, brand book and target audience profile to help you figure out what your packaging should look like. This is actually the old ocean vodka packaging before they got super fancy. So somebody was doing something right. You're able to get PR placement and talk about things that matter to you. I did some work for the Kona Brewers Festival. You'll be able to capture people's imagination with a product. We all know what this is, don't we? Yum. And you can start to have a whole brand experience, not just a product. You can make your brand go from ho hum to heck yeah. And hopefully you'll get some of those brand evangelists who are just really huge fans. <laughs> Ultimately, the goal is we want people to align themselves with your brand. You want to cut through the obstacles and connect with your customers as individuals. You want them to remember you. You gotta have a compelling story behind what you do. And if you do, they will reward you with loyalty um, by telling their audience about them as well, their network. It's a jungle out there, I totally know. There's a lot of stuff to go through. So if you do have questions, please feel free to reach out to me. And um, here's my information in case you would like to connect. And if you want, I am including the QR code to that branding process diagram one more time um, in case you wanted to download it again. So at this time, I think uh, Dennis and Marty and I are hoping that anybody has some questions. I don't know if you guys dropped anything in the chat um, or if there's anything you'd like to revisit. We definitely have some time. I have a question. Um... Uh, we talk a lot about like uh, our target audience, and I have a good idea of. Oh, can you hear me? Hello. I can. It was a little glitchy, but you were saying your target audience. Can you hear me? Yeah, it was a little glitchy. Your target audience. Okay. Um. Yeah, and I have an idea because my product is pretty niche, but when I really get into the details and I keep going, I start to think, well. A lot of this is conjecture because I don't really know until I start um, selling the product. So I just don't know. I guess I just want to be more clear. And I'm not sure if there's a way to be more clear before you're selling the product. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, for sure. Um, maybe you, if you wouldn't mind muting, maybe there's a, an echo <laughs> for everybody. And I'll try to answer your question. Um, so if your product doesn't exist yet and you don't have any real data, it's absolutely conjecture and that's okay. Um, the people who you are targeting that you're going to be selling to, whatever problem you're solving, they've had that problem before you came along and there's probably something that they were doing to address it and to answer it. Um, and so you can look at the things that they were doing beforehand to solve that problem and what other people have that problem. And, um, have that be your initial target audience. Uh, as your product 
launches, a branding is not necessarily something that's static and just is always the same thing. Um, it's great to revisit it every six months to a year and be like, is this still legitimate? Is this still what I thought? Is this being backed up by data? Um, you can also look at um, pro other products in your space and see what kind of people are buying them. Sometimes you can go on Amazon maybe or something like that and look at products that are in your space and see what the reviews say. Look at the pictures. Do they look like they have a family? Um, are they male or female? Uh, how do they talk about it? Do they sound sophisticated and educated? Do they sound really casual and youthful and maybe early in their life? And so you can start to mine these other things to build coupled together like an initial idea of your target audience, even if you don't really have uh, an audience yet. Is that, is that helpful? Sorry. Awesome. Thanks. Does anyone you know, else have a question? I, yeah. I have more, more of a comment. You know, I'm, I'm struck by how similar the stuff you say is to what we talk about with people about writing a business plan. Absolutely. And, it's, and really, you know, you're talking a lot about the presentation of the company to the public. And I think that also carries over to how you operate the company. And it's all about authenticity. Um, yeah. So the, the example I always use is, you know, if you're going to present yourself as an Ohana kind of company, we serve the Ohana. You better be answering the phone politely. You better you better be cheerful. You better not operate at odds to that image you're trying to project yeah um, so it's just really striking how similar uh, the authenticity thing is pretty similar absolutely it's i think that i would love it if business plans had a brand strategy section that would make me really happy okay <laughs> we should talk later about that Actually, I'll add that what you do. What we talk, I talk, we talk about the same things about imagine who your customer is. What does that person look like? Where did they show? I love it. Yes. Yeah. Um, another thing about the target audience, especially for brands that have like a bigger product line or they're a little bit more nuanced, there's often multiple target audiences. Um, and sometimes as you go through the process, you realize that that's when they start to come out and come to life. And you may even realize you have like three or four or something like that. Um, and if you do start to, if you guys do go through that process and you start to get overwhelmed and feel like, Oh my God, there's just so many of them. Um, keep in mind that they can often be lumped together. And just because some are men or, or some are women, for example, doesn't mean that you can't talk to them the same way. If their motivations are similar, if their lifestyle is similar. If the way they see themselves are similar, um, the actual changes, the differences in the demographics don't matter as much as the why they do what they do and what their life experience is like. So sometimes you can cluster them together or sometimes there's even like um, an aspirational group, like for North Face, for example, there's the people who climb the mountains and then there's the people who wish they were climbing the mountains, but they're like maybe like weekend warriors, you know? And by speaking to the people who actually climb the mountains, Sometimes you can successfully get the ones who aspire to be like that. Um, and so you don't necessarily have to split your communications. For sure. Uh, we have a question in the chat about pricing and I'll, I'll change it a little bit. What, what could one expect to pay for a, a branding consultant, a brand analysis or whatever? Yeah, you thank you for asking about that. Um, I have a, a brand consulting package that's a, a monthly $750 a month for me to meet with you regularly and guide you through the process. You can come to a workshop like this. It's uh, $15 that's donated to the SBDC. I'm also coming out with a, um, a do-it-yourself branding workshop that is self-guided and that you fill it out and I guide you through every step of the way. And at the end of it, you have a filled PDF that has all the answers in it. Um, and then on the larger end, if you hire, I'm, I'm a consultant, right? But you can hire a branding firm those are like tens of thousands of dollars and they like fly people out to you and it's a little crazy, but um, I hope that's, that's helpful. I, I like what you had to say about colors and the feel of a website, because I know we sometimes see people when they're just starting and you'll go to a website and it's 
like they might be a business consultant and their website looks like it's for kids because <laughs> they like a lot of color and yeah. they try to make it exciting. But it's like, you know, thinking about what your audience is looking for in creating a brand that they can trust and feel. I mean, it's just, it's things we don't think about. That's why we have people like you. <laughs> Because we don't always <laughs> think about what does this look like to our audience. We know we like yeah. the colors, but yeah, sometimes they're right. And there's a difference between figuring out what your brand is and then how to express it, right? Yeah. Like just because you are exciting and you're excited about what you do, maybe that doesn't necessarily translate into a ton of colors that are used judiciously all over your website maybe like copywriting or like to, uh, really different sized font or something like that is enough excitement for your end user. So a good comment. Any other questions from anybody that we can ask our expert about? Um, I've got a quick question. Alicia, hi, it's Polly. Hey, Polly. Um, hi. So um, I've worked with Alicia. She's awesome. I just want to put that out there. <laughs> so a little plug. Um, but, um, you know, so you talk about your target audience and let's say you've identified your target audience, but they're, but they're um, different, you know? So, um, and I don't know if you can, if this is a general question or more, I guess you'd have to drill down, but um, do you, do you suggest sort of marketing to trying to do like all of them or drilling down on one and seeing what works, you know, like your best use of time and you're going to narrow this idea yeah. down. Kind of, does that make sense? Like, yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I think in some cases, as, as we know, Holly, there's like a foundational audience that has to be one first so that you can move up the, the ladder to the next one. Um, for yeah. example, um, if you're doing a marketplace, you might have the, you might have both sides of the matchmaking need to be, uh, drawn in for there to be any sort of a draw there, um, mm -hmm. to the marketplace at all. Like, what are you selling and who's, who's going to buy it and you need to have both. Um, on the other hand, if you are selling a product or a service or a widget and you have different target audiences that might feel very different, um, the messaging doesn't necessarily need to address all of them for all cases. A lot of times a certain part target audience, their media mix that they consume will be different from another. So if this group of people have these motivations and this lifestyle, maybe they're more likely to be influenced by things on social media, maybe TikTok specifically. And then this group over here is more professional and they want facts and data and they might be more likely to be looking at news media or like LinkedIn or something like that. And so you can take your message and still have it, but speak in a different way. Like if you are trying to assert the quality of what you offer, maybe on TikTok, you're doing like demonstrations of it and you're doing testimonials and it's from users and it's really casual. Um, and then on like peer reviewed media articles or something like that with LinkedIn, you're still asserting the quality of it, but maybe it's third party experts that are doing it. Maybe it's studies and statistics. Um, stuff like that to, to maybe like communicate the same brand promise, but mm -hmm. to your two different audiences that have like a different relationship with your brand. One might see you as like a trusted friend and the other one might see you as like the authority figure, just as an example. So different, different media could do that. Um, so you're you saying, I mean, it's certainly, it's certainly okay to kind of do do it all <laughs> and see what sticks you know you don't have to stick to one of your target audiences you can kind of do all simultaneously right or simultaneously. ideally yes and i was i was um i was gonna say you definitely want to make sure you don't alienate one for the other you know right um and perhaps my i just like came out with the example out of the blue perhaps that's not like the best example because your relationship with the audience is different in those two examples um you would never want your like casual communications to uh, undermine you as an authority to the other audience. So if, even if it is like a TikTok video, maybe it has to be someone in a suit, you know, <laughs> that's like an expert in it, that's doing it. Um, so yeah. ideally, yeah, ideally it, it speaks to everyone. 
Awesome. And especially if you have a website. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Thanks for asking that. All right. I mean, to cut you off, I just wanted, I don't want to take all your time, but thank you. No, no, that, that, I think it's a good one. Um, I was just going to say also on your website, like that's a really easy place to parse your different audiences because you can sort of have like a choose your adventure. Um, for example, um, on my website, I know that uh, some of my clients are if they're a business owner, they often want to know that I have worked with a business like theirs. They want to know what my industry experience is. And so I have a client list that is divided by type of industry. And so it allows them to like browse through there and look for like, oh, great. She's worked with architects before and there's eight of them. Um, on the other hand, if uh, I also get outsourced by agencies, uh, tech firms, branding agencies, marketing firms will sometimes hire me and bring me in as an expert to do branding. And they're more interested in the breadth of services that I've done and that I can serve a broad range of, of different industries. And so my portfolio is more geared towards them. Um, and so if you start to understand the things that are important to your different types of audiences, you can segment your website like that um, so that everyone gets whatever the information is that they're looking for. We have a question in the chat uh, from one of our viewers who has a terrible internet, so uh, better to put it in Sorry. the chat. And it has to do with scaling the business. Mm -hmm. So um, if you know that your marketplace may grow or change, how do you scale your branding? So she's saying her example is for a health food store, she would go more niche and mystical, but for bigger stores, she would shift the branding, but that wouldn't happen until she starts at the smaller level. So how does she make those branding choices now? Yeah, I'm so glad that you're thinking of that because at the very beginning of the brand process, like it's so important to, to put down your goals, your growth goals, because um, you don't want to clip your wings, right? And I do think um, what you're talking about, the brand itself isn't changing, just the expression of it and like the look and feel that you're going for might look more polished and more organized and a little bit more clear space and, and like the way things are expressed might be a little more, more um, slick or like a corporate uh, placement in a, a brand, uh, excuse me, in a, a retail environment. So I do think you can look at some of the other brands out there. This is, if I'm understanding it correctly, like this sounds sort of like the application of the brand is, is where you're going to need to make that nuance, right? So if you have a creative person who's a copywriter or a designer or a website designer, and you told them that you are trying to get placed in um, mom and pop, hippie, crunchy, like all natural stores, they might express your brand in this way. And if you told them that you were wanting to get placed by like Target, um, they might go more this way. So whenever you're ready to do that design, I think you need to tell them to like bridge the gap or it be somewhere between. and um, a good designer will do a bunch of research on that. They'll look for other brands like maybe like Sunbum sunscreen that started mm -hmm. off kind of uh, darling and boutique, but they've, man, they've blown up. Right. Um, or maybe some kombucha brands that started off more crunchy and then they got bigger. Um, I don't know if that's helpful, but hopefully basically your brand, your brand strategy, like what your brand is does not change, but the, the application of it in terms of design and, and, and ex creative expression would, would be a little bit different. Can you talk a little bit about branding in, in, in a non-media intensive environment? I mean, cause you said you're very visual. We've been talking about media and various things like that. However, Hawaii is a pretty relational place and everything goes by relationships and not everybody is doing that kind of media here because they don't need to or they just that this don't mm -hmm. so how does branding pertain in a more elemental situation like that i mean about your identity in the community yeah more grassroots absolutely yeah. um well there's the shopping experience right there's the brand experience your signage your storefront your plantings, like, is there music? Is there not? How do your, what's the training manual like for your, your 
um, customer service representatives? How do they interact with people? What does their apparel look like? Are they, is it, is it a formal environment? Is it casual? Is it upbeat? Is it sleepy? Um, and then you have, maybe you're doing some, you know, like referral marketing or like individual outreach, um, in which case you're deciding to go to some sorts of events. So if you define your target audience, you can, it can help you select events that they're more likely to be at. And then if your brand is playful, um, maybe you hand something out at events. Um, one of my clients is a, uh, an app that connects indie artists, musicians with, uh, small venues. And I encouraged her to buy pop rocks. You guys remember pop rocks, the things you put on your tongue and then they like go nuts and foam up or something gross. <laughs> Why do we eat these? I'm sure that's not good for you, but anyways, she got pop rocks and then stapled it to business cards and hands those out when she goes to events because it's super memorable and she's dealing with rock musicians, Right. Right. Um, on the other hand, if you're a more, you know, like reserved a client and need to assert your thought leadership, maybe you decide that instead of going to networking events, you try to sit on panels where you're an expert with other people. That's a great way to get your name out in that regard, because it's not just you're, you're spreading it out to your audience, right? But it's a panel discussion. So each of the other five people on the panel has their network that they're promoting it to. And then whoever's hosting it has the net, the, um, has a network as well. And you get dividends. You can talk about it beforehand on social media. You can um, take pictures while you're there. You can have quote, quotes from it you know, a blog article about it. You can video record it and then have it on YouTube later and SEO optimize it to drive traffic to your website. Um, I'm kind of just spitballing, but um, mm-hmm. those are some examples of how, even if you're not placing media brand strategy can definitely help you be more targeted with your uh, efforts and reach your target audience. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Anything else, anyone? I like what you said about using the heck out of everything. <laughs> Absolutely. Like plastered everywhere. <laughs> All the things. Yeah. All the things. <laughs> well, thank you so much for your time, Alicia, and your. My pleasure. Manalo. And you can get in touch with Alicia, as you can see there. There's her email and her website. And this recording will, if you want to see this again or go back to some of those QR codes, which like me, because I didn't have my phone here, um, the recording will be sent out to all of you in probably a day or so. Um, Thank you so much for hosting me, you guys. Alicia, somebody asked if you have a newsletter. I don't. I okay. should. And now you're taking, new, <laughs> obviously you're taking new clients. That was the other I question. am taking new clients. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank, thank you, you so, so much, much, Alicia. Thanks, guys. You're giving us lots of things. Appreciate thank you. you. Aloha. Aloha. Oh, wait a minute. I got to do the poll. Wait. Hang on a second. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Oh. <laughs> don't go away. Where the poll? Are oh, there it is. Escaping. Okay, there it is. Answer the poll. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. It's not coming up, Marty. Nope, let me do it. There's only okay. seven people left. <laughs> I know. There it is. Okay. Great. I'm going to stop recording. <laughs>